This evening's sermon needs a little preemptive of how we got to where we're going and where we're going to actually go tonight. In the ladies' Bible class that meets at 10 on Wednesdays recently, we were studying in Romans 7. Romans 7 is a great chapter. A lot's happening in and out of that chapter. But the main brunt from that chapter is, are we under the law? That's the easiest, simplest way we can put it. And in the midst of that discussion, some questions were asked. Uh, one question that was asked was, was the Old Testament system perfect? In other words, did it do exactly as it was designed to do? Did it do what it was set out for? The answer is yes. The Old Testament system did exactly as it was designed, which tells us something. When God plans something, it's going to be correct. Each and every time. Even when we're talking about something that spanned thousands of years, it's going to come out correct each and every time. So Romans 7 was our consideration. And in the midst of that, the question was posed, and I, I do not remember who, who asked it. Don't you think we have it a little better now? Just ponder that for a minute. Think of all of the things that exist inside of the Old Testament. All of the feast days. All of the law requirements. Remember how the temple and the tabernacle were supposed to be set up just so. Just correct. Remember all of the organizational structures that existed in the midst of the tribe of Levi. Remember their worship. Remember their days of remembrance. How many of those can we list and get them all properly correct? Well, we started discussing that and how it was a great system to be under. We talked about something else, and this is the main thought for me of the differences between the old and the new law. Their sins were rolled forward. In other words, they were always on their account. Remember, each time, once a year, or at least once a year, the, most high, the high priest would go into the most holy of holies, and perform something that is described in the old law. And that was to roll their sins forward. It wasn't until the time of the cross that those sins were removed ever upon their account. It's a difference between the old law and the new. We imagine ourselves tonight, if you're a child of God, if you follow the way God's pattern has depicted for you, the moment you came up out of that water, what were you? Clean as white. We sing songs sometimes that depict the robes of white that we wear as Christians, especially one who has come up in a new life. Remember the New Testament talks about the new child of God, how he becomes a new creature, he becomes a new man, and he puts off all of the old. He's pure, he's pristine, he's new. That's a blessing we have. And that's a wonderful thing we have. We know according to Colossians 2.14 that the old law was nailed to the cross. It was put away. But it's good for us. If you don't know this about me yet, you'll find out very soon. I love the Old Testament. I believe the Old Testament gives us a depiction of who God is. I believe the Old Testament can teach us how we, as those who are trying to obey God, should interact with God. It also teaches us, in a roundabout way, what I need to do when I mess things up. Now the Old Testament system does not teach me, here, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. The Old Testament system does teach you that when sin is present, it needs to be made right with God. Talked about God this morning. We know who God is. He's not some small God. He's not someone who is powerless, effortless, thoughtless. He's planned. So what we're going to do tonight, in brevity, 
is go to the book of Numbers. We don't spend a lot of time there. Go ahead and turn with me to Numbers 19. That's the first place we'll be. And we want to do two things. Number one, we want to look at some of the things that they had to do. Some of the things they had to observe. And we want to understand that was right. Because God was the one who authored those things for them to do. That's why Romans 15.4 is important. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. That we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have, one of my favorite biblical words, hope. We're looking for hope tonight. We're looking at two systems contrasting them, but number two, and this is really the main emphasis of what we're looking at, I want to see if I can find a depiction or a type or an anti-type of Christ in the book of Numbers. That's why I started out talking about the song, Anywhere. And I expect that tonight in the three different accounts we're going to look at, first beginning in Numbers 19, we are going to find a depiction of Jesus the Savior. Numbers 19 depicts one who was slain outside the camp, and that will become more significant to us in just a moment. Uh, let's get some introductory materials to number 19. Uh, when we look in the beginnings or in the endings of Numbers 18, we see all these different things that are happening. Uh, if we look at the very beginning, and I don't know how your Bible is arranged, but you find all these little titles, and they help us understand what's happening as, as we're just breezing through. Uh, but chapter 18 begins with Aaron's change, the tabernacle, how the Levites were supposed to serve, when we get down to verse 9, we get some depictions of offerings, and these are offerings that are specific to the priest. So I want you to notice that they're offerings reserved for the priest. There's not an inheritance for Aaron being described here, but verse 24 begins the Levite's inheritance. So there's some things that are happening, all sorts of different laws and regulations. These are things that were very important for them to pay attention to. I imagine it could have been a very good sermon. Here's what you need to do. When we hit chapter 19, I want you to see the title that's given to chapter 19. I don't know if it's the same in yours as it is in mine, but I'm going to read mine. Laws of Purification for Sin. Keep that in mind as we continue to go through this particular chapter. Really just down to verse 19, but we'll look at the entire chapter. We'll set the scene for you. And give you the scenario of why chapter 19 exists. Death exists. That means something very crucial. The body in which we live in now, at some time, will no longer live. It will no longer breathe. It will not need oxygen. It will no longer be able to see hear, touch, taste, smell, all the things the body does, the heart will cease beating. The other organs will stop their work. That body will be called lifeless or dead. That tells us something else. When I die, someone's going to have to take care of my body. We have a very elaborate burial system now. And throughout the ages, many scenarios have been the same. When we get down to the beginning of chapter 20, we're going to find death. The death of Miriam. Someone's going to have to handle or take care of Miriam. That's not to be disrespectful toward death. That's not to be irreverent toward it. But what we need to understand is death exists. And preparation to the body happens after death. It's been like that for centuries. But remember, laws of purification for sin. Uh, notice verse 2 as we begin. Remember, verse 1 tells us that Moses and Aaron were saying these things. This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord hath commanded, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring thee a red heifer without spot, where there is no blemish, and upon which never came yoke. And ye shall give her unto Eleazar the priest, that he may bring forth without the camp. 
and one shall slay her before his face. And Eliezer the priest shall take off her blood with his finger and sprinkle of her blood directly before the tabernacle of the congregation seven times. And one shall burn the heifer in his sight, and her skin and her flesh and her blood and her dung shall be burned. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast it into the midst of the burning heifer. Then the priest shall wash his clothes and he shall bathe his flesh in water and afterward he shall come into the camp. And the priest shall be unclean until the eve. Until the even. And he that burneth her shall wash his clothes with water and bathe his flesh in water and he shall be unclean in the evening. And a man that is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and lay them up without the camp in a clean place. And it shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for a water of separation. It is a purification for sin. And he that gathereth the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes and be unclean to the even. And it shall be unto the children of Israel and to the stranger that sojourneth along a statute forever. Did you notice anything in that passage? It's the only thing that really sticks out to my mind. It's very specific. It is listed in exact order of what needs to happen. Here is how it's to be done. Here is who's going to do some of these things. Here is what's going to happen after it is completed. The ashes are going to be kept in a certain place. Here is what those that are involved in this practice are going to do afterwards. And they're not going to be considered clean until the even. That's a very specific role. Let's go back to that first thought. Laws of purification for sin. You may be asking, what, what sin? What is synonymously equaled with sin? What did sin bring about? Death. Both spiritual and physical death. And there's some laws regarding these ashes that we're going to learn. And let's just go ahead and look at verse 11. And this will help us understand this sin. He that toucheth the dead body of any man shall be unclean seven days. If they came into contact, and this is something we got to talking about in the Romans class, there were some things that were very specific for them to do. It was a part of what God required of them. And all the things they had to keep up with. If I were to come into contact with a dead body, there's a very great, and we're going to use this word, and we're not using it irreverently, but it describes the whole scenario, a great ritual of things that I would need to do to be considered unclean. If you look at the end of the chapter, the one who has touched the dead body, if he comes into the temple, he's going to make the temple unclean. And those things in which he's going to come in contact with as one who is unclean, they will be unclean. So these individuals needed to be clean before they brought their offerings, before they came into the temple, before they came into their homes. They needed to make sure they were clean. Here, of this occasion, of touching a dead body. That's a natural thing of life. And when we want something clean, we just take water. Sometimes we'll take a cleaner if it really needs to be cleaned. But generally, some things can just be cleaned right off with water. If we want pure water, what do we do sometimes? I know we have tap water that's pretty pure, but if we want something that's better than that, what do we run it through? We run it through a filter. We understand purity in that aspect, in that right. But God's way of purification for those who had come in contact with the dead body was the slaying, or the slaying of a red heifer outside of the camp. What does that have to do with you and me, though? This is where I want us to center in real, real, real carefully. If I touch a dead body, am I going to have to do this? The answer is no. Then what's the learning here? Or Romans 15, 4, what's the things written a time written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of Scripture might have hope. What's the learning? What's the patience? What's the comfort here that brings me that hope that I want. 
That hope that I desire. How many of us hope for heaven? I hope every one of you do. I hope you long for it. I hope you want to be there so bad you can't stand it. So what in the world does this have to do with us? Number one, God's specific. Number two, God had a plan for these individuals. But number three, God wanted to cleanse them. And number four, Christ was the one that was slain outside of the camp. I told you when we began we were going to try to find the depiction of where Christ fit in in the book of Numbers. And here He is. Remember when Jesus was to be crucified, where did they take Him? They didn't take Him to the middle of the city. They didn't take Him to the justice center. Remember they took Him outside the city. Outside of the camp. Go back to Leviticus 19, verse 2. Read this and think of Christ. Speaking unto the children of Israel, that they bring a red heifer without spot, where there is no blemish and upon which, and upon which never came yoke. Pure. Holy. No blemish. Without spot. A depiction of things. Uh, Hebrews 13.12 tells us that Jesus was put on the cross so He could sanctify. He could set those part, people apart with their blood. In John 19.30, when Jesus was upon the cross, and this is a very uh, crucial moment for us because it gives us hope. And when we think of the one that was slain outside of the camp, and we think of John 19.30, remember what Jesus said? It is finished. Ah, salvation exists now. So Numbers 19 in the Christian, Jesus was slain outside the camp. And that is very crucial for us to remember. Now let's go back to Numbers 9. Numbers 9. Uh, specifically looking at Numbers 9 verse 2. And this is going to be something that's to a degree familiar to us. Uh, maybe not all the ins and outs of this. Read verse 9 with me. Let the children of Israel also keep the Passover at His appointed season. A couple of very important things we're going to notice from this. If we go back to Exodus 12, verses 1-14, through we're going to find all of the specifics that happen with that particular rite of Passover. Remember the children of Israel wanted to escape the final plague of Egypt, which we talked about this morning which was a direct depiction at the God, which was Pharaoh, they were commanded to keep this Passover feast. And I think many of you can already imagine what's happening here. The feast would require each household to take a lamb on the tenth day of the first month. And if the house was too small, they would combine with another home and they would do this together. The lamb was to be without blemish. It was a male of the first year. It was to be kept at that home until the 14th day of that month. On the 14th day, each home would slay the lamb in the evening without breaking any bones of this lamb. They would take the blood and strike it on the two side posts and the upper post of the door. That may be the most familiar part of this context to us. They would then roast this flesh and eat it that night. And if anything was left over that evening, they would burn it with fire so that nothing was left. These were the commandments that God gave them in Exodus 12, 1-14. There are some specific things about when they would eat. Their loins would be girded, their shoes would be on, their staff would be at hand, and they would be ready to go at haste. Remember, they're trying to leave Egypt. They were to be prepared, ready, willing, standing their staff in hand. That's as prepared as it gets. As you remember, when the blood was seen on the post, it would be counted as a token, and the house would be passed over. Numbers 9 records, or at least is the first recording of the Passover, after it was recorded in the book of Exodus, chapter 12. 
Some specific things come up in Numbers 9. Go back there with me. Verse 3, specifically in the 14th day of this month, At even ye shall keep it in his appointed season, according to all the rites of it. And according to the ceremonies thereof shall ye keep it. We need to pause for just a minute. Go back to one of those Romans 15.4 moments and figure out why this is important to us. Number one, this is important to the Christian because I need to be ready. They were waiting, anticipating, longing to leave Egypt. And they prepared that meal just as they were told to. They took care of the remains thereof of that meal just as they were told to. And in the midst of eating this meal, they were clothed and staff in hand, ready at haste. I want to ask us a question. This is very personal to each one of us individually. Are we ready for heaven at this very moment? We don't think about that very often in the book of Numbers. They needed to be ready to depart. Am I? Are we? The Lord came back right now. Would all of us be inside of heaven's gates? Only you can answer that. But that's one of the depictions that we notice from this particular chapter. And there's going to be more that we're going to see. In the midst of all of these requirements for the Passover, a clear image of Jesus is seen. Number one, Christ the Lamb. Christ was a young man that was offered like the young lamb. John 1.29 gives us the depiction. 1 Peter 1.19, he was without blemish and without spot. 1 Peter 2.22 says he was even without sin. That's the purest lamb we can find. He was taken from his people who were the Jews, being the seed of David, Romans 1.3. In the account of the crucifixion even, remember something very specific that happened to him? The Passover lamb was to be slain with no bones broken. Our Savior was slain with no bones broken. There's also the blood that's being applied that Jesus depicts. The blood from the cross that flows through the waters of baptism can reach everyone. But just like the blood of those lambs in the Passover, they only reach those that were under its grasp. If you've never come into contact with the blood of Jesus, then you are not under its saving power. You're not under its possibility to save. That tells me something. I need to be in the Lord's house. Just as those people in the, in waiting on the Passover in Egypt, where did they have to be? Inside those posts of that, blood, that home. What was it covered in? Oh, that blood of that precious lamb. I need to be in that house. I need to be girded and ready. Christ is seen here in Numbers 9. There's one other we need to look at. Go over to Numbers 21. Numbers 21. Numbers 21 is my favorite depiction in the book of Numbers because it depicts unto us God's care for mankind. It also depicts unto us how mankind generally finds a way to mess it up. Some way, somehow, it generally happens. For the most part, in the Old Testament, especially during the days of the Israelites, the days of their wanderings, and even times before and after, God's people were a murmuring people. We don't use the word murmuring very often. They complained a whole lot. Not just a little, not just a great amount, they complained all the time. Numbers 21 is a depiction of some of these complaints. Go to verse 5. Numbers 21, verse 5. Listen to the first phrase of this verse very carefully. And the people spake against 
God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. Before we get to verse 6, let's pause. What had God provided these people after leaving Egypt? Well, number one, as they left Egypt, Egypt gave them, as God's providence, everything they needed from gold, silver, to, to, to the clothing, and many times, they gave them everything they could to get out. God blessed them there. As they were wandering around, what did God bless them with when they needed water? Where did it come from? When they needed food, where did that come from? And time and time and over and over again, what did God do for them? He prepared and blessed them. Verse 5 says, They spake against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt? Insinuating we had it made while we were there. They didn't have it made. They were slaves. We forget that so often in Numbers 21. These people wanted to go back to slavery and oppression. But also they said we don't have any bread, any water. Did you notice the depiction in verse 5? And our soul loathed this light bread. But I didn't think you had any bread. See, they had what they needed. They just weren't happy with what they were given. So they stood up against God and against Moses as God's spokesperson and said, Lord, we don't want this anymore. We're done. That's the southern vernacular of what happened. Notice verse 6. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people. And much people of Israel died. Death is very serious. Sometimes we bring about it because of sin. Here is a depiction of sin in which was created and death that very immediately followed. Notice verse 7. They knew what they had done. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. I want to make two interjections here. Number one, these people knew that they had sinned and that they needed to make it right with God. Number two, how good was Moses here? Oh, he's speaking against God and against thee. Pray for us. How hard is it to pray for someone that's wronged you? What about a nation? Here they are coming to Moses. We were wrong. We spoke against you. We spoke against God. Pray for us. We're dying here. We learn a third lesson. Even though God's people stood against God and stood against God's spokesperson, God loved them. He sent a very plain message for Israel and a very plain and easy way for them to make it right. Verses 8 and 9. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bidden, when he looketh upon it, shall live. Verse 9, Moses did just as the Lord commanded him to do. It's said that the bites of these fiery serpents depicted here could be felt through the entire body as if it were fire. These people suffered. I don't want us to miss that. They stood against God and they suffered till their deaths, many of them. Makes you think back to Numbers 19. Imagine the purification that had to happen amidst the camp here. Does this remind you of anything? Here are people who have sinned. They're praying to the Lord and they need to be forgiven and they know God can give that. 
And God's answer in this particular scenario from the serpents in which he sent upon them because of their sins was to put a fiery serpent, fashion it, make it, cover it in brass, and put it on a pole. Does that not make your mind go anywhere? Numbers 21 is a depiction of an image on high. Someone else who was put upon a cross to save men for their sins. In this particular scenario, they were saved. They lived from these fiery serpents. With Jesus on the cross, we can live from fiery sins. And not only can we live from them, can we be saved from them, but unlike in the Old Testament, with Jesus, we can be washed clean. The only remedy for sin was to look at the cross. It was the love of God that saved mankind, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Titus 3.4 says it's the kindness of God that saves mankind. Romans 3.20 tells us that God came because mankind had sinned and they needed a Savior. We can see Jesus saving us from our sins. And we can see a type of Jesus in the book of Numbers in verse 21. We've looked at three different accounts tonight. All of which vary from what they talk about. All of which give us an idea or an image of the Christ. Here's the most crucial point of the sermon. Where do you fit in with all of this? Are you going to be one who is bitten by a fiery serpent? The snake on the pole was placed and you're going to turn around and say, I'm not looking at it. God will have to save me some other way. Or are you going to take the avenue that God has given you to be saved? Are you going to be one who has come, un- become to be unclean? And stand up and say, God's going to have to make me clean some other way? Or would you make it right in the way God has put it for you? That's the only options we have. Am I going to do it the way I want to? Or am I going to do it God's way? Tonight you have the opportunity to do it God's way. You can make your life right with Him. That's what matters. We say over and over from this pulpit, you're not making it right with me, whoever's speaking here. Paul and I both. You're not coming unto us. We rejoice in that moment. We love to help you in that moment. But you're not coming to me so I can wash your sins away. You're coming unto the Lord. And that's the only way it exists. Two questions that are crucial. Are you a child of God? Yes or no? If it's no, do you want to be? I think your answer is yes. The question is, what are you going to do about it? Question number two, are you a child of God? I hope so. If yes, are you faithful to Him? Yes or no, that's the only answer. If you are, thank the Lord. If you're not, make it right with the Lord. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea,